Students of Bible prophecy are watching Israel. And why are they watching Israel? Well, here to talk about that is author, lecturer, Doug Hershey. Doug, pleasure to have you back on uh, Prophecy Watch. Thanks Water. for having me again. And we've, we, uh, of course, did a prior program and just got started because I thought of so many things we didn't talk about yeah. on, on our first get-together. But what Doug has done, for those of you who may not have watched, he's put together this book called Israel Rising. And boy, is Israel ever rising. Israel Rising, and the idea is that he took old photos and compared them with new photos from exactly the same perspective, for the same position, which, by the way, is work, hard work, finding the locations, it's I suppose. fun work. Fun work. Fun work, yes, indeed. <laughs> it's like a treasure hunt every day. And, and some of these old pictures in this book, uh, well, I guarantee that when you pick up the book, you won't put it down because you'll look at one picture and then you turn the page. Ooh, that's even better. And you'll turn the page. And this goes on forever. But uh, what's the oldest picture in this book uh, of Israel? The oldest photo of, uh, of Jerusalem ever taken, the oldest photo in the book, is from uh, 1844. Wow, and uh, which is amazing. It's uh, there, there's a section in the book about Mark Twain, and Mark Twain goes through the land in 1867. And when we talk about sort of historical accounts of of what the land looked like, most people are familiar with Mark Twain. This photo from Jerusalem, the first ever taken, was you know over 20 years before his journeys through the land, and uh, and it's really stunning. It's uh, it's it's quite a rundown. Looks looks like a dump. Well, Mark Twain's. Uh uh, perception of Israel was was less than than beautiful. That's right. He uh, he thought maybe it was the worst piece of land on planet Earth, right? Yeah, I mean he came through. Uh, I think maybe expecting uh, something uh, a little bit more, have a little bit more grandeur with it. But he, um, you know, he talks about being down by the Dead Sea, and he said it reminds him of a funeral and of death. You know, and he talks yeah. about you know being up in the uh, up by the Sea of Galilee and um, seeing sheep. You know, eating something on the, assuming that the sheep were eating gravel because there was nothing else, you know, for them to eat. It was just there was nothing there. Now, one of the things you'll notice, in fact, is the thing you'll notice uh, comparing the old and the new photographs, uh, is the lush vegetation. The old photographs are denuded. Let's talk about that uh, a bit, mm -hmm. because uh, in some way, I, I think the devil must hate lush vegetation. Because the people that had control of the land during Israel's diaspora seemed to hate trees. They did everything they could to get rid of trees, right? Yeah, and you know, when any time that God's people were out of the land, um, the, the, the land had been conquered and reconquered multiple times. It never becomes a homeland for any other people group. And it never, the, the land itself never produces for anybody else. And one of the most dramatic times of desolation was during under the Ottoman rule from uh, 1517 to 1917 the Ottomans had a taxation policy where they would tax the inhabitants based on the amount of trees that you would have on your land and so if if you don't want to pay taxes you just you cut down your trees sure which completely decimates entire forests the the topsoil disappears uh, erosion takes over, animal populations move out. Uh, most historians agree that the land suffers its greatest desolation and wasteland under the Ottoman rule. And, um, and, and it's really, the entire place suffers. And so in, at the very end of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm when the British then take the land back in, in 1917. Yeah, and when you said that a minute ago, you know, my, uh, my little uh, uh, sparks started flying in my yeah. head, you know, I think, oh, 1917, 300 years. And, and when the British uh, uh, essentially gave leave to Israel to, to repopulate the land, yeah. uh, and even 300 years had elapsed, what are the odds? 
Yeah, well, uh, again, some of the photos of the books are, are coming from the 1880s to the 1940s, and so y you can visually see the evidence of what the Ottoman Empire did to the region. And uh, by the time that the British are coming in, I mean, there's, there's massive swamps. There's, uh, there's just, you know, Mark Twain writes in 1867 about, you know, going in you know, 10 miles in any direction and not seeing another human being or another, you know, habitation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then malaria just, was a big problem. Malaria, swamps, uh, nothing would grow. There's a, there's a beautiful photo of, uh, of an area called the Cursed Land that's in the book. And uh, it, it, it used to be what the Ottomans referred to as the Cursed Land because there was nothing that was growing. It was swamps. Uh, they, the, the Jewish pioneers in the late 1800s end up purchasing the land. The, the Turks obviously think they're getting a great deal because they're selling you know, swamp land where nothing grows and nobody lives. And the, the Jewish pioneers literally hand dig irrigation ditches. They drain the swamps with soup cans. And now it's the town of Hadera. It's about 15 minutes from Caesarea. Any, anybody who goes to Israel has been to Caesarea. Yeah. And it's now some of the most, most beautiful farmland of orchards and vineyards and Jewish communities. Well, you, you see banana trees. You see uh, tropical fruit. Yeah, mangoes, avocados. I mean, just anything. I mean, it's just the, the land is physically responding to Jewish sovereignty. And that's exactly what Ezekiel 36 said would happen. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Empire uh, is is still trying to be the Ottoman Empire. Recep Tayyip er Erdogan, uh, yes. a, 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 the fiend in charge of Turkey right now, yeah. would like to take everything back three three hundred years if he yeah. could. Yeah, uh, for he, sure. He wants to, to to reinstate the old Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. and and if he got his way, those trees would get chopped down again, I suppose. Well, you know, much of what is happening with the Israeli economy is coming out of agriculture. Uh, you know, when, when the Bible talks about the desert blooming, that's exactly what's happening. You know, from Israeli uh, farming technologies and advancements and drip irrigation, um, there are, uh, Isaiah 27 talks about that in that day that Israel or Jacob will take root and fill the earth with fruit. It's literally happening. It's tangibly happening. Much of that is happening in what used to be swamplands, like we were talking about, or down in the Negev Desert. And um, fruits, vegetables, flowers are being exported all over. And uh, again, going back to Ezekiel 36, it's exactly what Ezekiel said would happen. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning of uh, our program, uh, Israel is about to celebrate uh, its 70th anniversary. That's right. Uh, the 70th anniversary of stated. As I watch Israel, I see <clears throat> is not a haphazard development, so much as I see the plan of God just opening by in in little bits. And and uh, as it is open, suddenly we who are reading the Bible and watching Bible prophecy begin to say, well, "Wait a minute, that's happening just exactly like the Bible said it would happen." That's right. And the numbers are all there. 1917. Well, 1897, the first Zionist Congress, 50 years later, statehood. Right. Yeah, as things seem to happen on a clock-like basis in yeah. Israel. You know, the anniversaries uh, uh, just come at regular intervals, and now we're seeing the 70th anniversary. A lot of people are saying uh, big things could be happening in Israel this year. Yeah, as, as you know, God is all about times and seasons. You know, yeah. in, in His biblical calendar, there's specific things that happen. The numbers are, are specific. Uh, numbers are significant to Him. So uh, it was 70 years of uh, Babylonian captivity when God brings the people back to the land, and there was a profound establishment, not only of of, uh, of the people back to the land, but also there was a spiritual connection, as, as, uh, as we read in the book of Ezra, uh, about you know, calling the people back to back to God and His ways, and so in the in the 70th year, I think that we'll we'll probably begin to see more of that. You know, I'm reading in uh, Ezekiel 36, 38, uh, and by the way, you, you need to sit down. I think when you when you get uh, this book, you, you you sit down with Doug's book, have your Bible open uh, to uh, the 36th chapter of Ezekiel. It's just laid out. It is and the pictures and the and the biblical verses just go together, uh, and and it starts out talking about the enemies of Israel. It says even the high places are ours; we we own them. And as you go down through uh, Ezekiel thirty six, it point by point, step by step, yeah. the people come back, the land is restored, and then the people themselves are spiritually restored. And here at the very last verse of Ezekiel thirty six, it says, "As the holy flock." 
as the holy flock uh, of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men and they shall know that I am the Lord. So the end of this, Israel is coming back to God. Absolutely. And the most repeated promise through the Old Testament is that God will return His people back to the land. It's over, over 140 times it's mentioned. And so, you know, in, in terms of God talking to people, you know, if you have a, a friend or a spouse or a relative that you continue to repeat something to, it's because it's something that's special to you and it's significant and you want them to know. Here in the Old Testament we have God saying over 140 times, I'm going to return you to the land that I promised you. And so the fact that that's happening right now, just in Bible prophecy alone, is is profound. I mean, there's things that are happening right now in Israel that uh, that the prophets spoke about. They've been lying dormant for 2,600 years, and it's happening. And the the fact that the people are coming back is is a profound uh, demonstration of God's faithfulness. He's doing it exactly as He said He was going to do. Now, I've talked with Doug enough uh, in our short acquaintance to know that he's he's a realist. Uh, you conduct tours, by the way, to uh, to Israel. Um, tell us about that. Uh, you 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 take uh, small tours, and I suppose you visit the whole land. Well, you know, there's so much to see and so much to uh, to, to cover. I, I tell my my groups uh, that we, you know, I could take the same group back four or five times, and it'd be brand new every time. Yeah. Um, but I the the company is called Ezra Adventures. We do small group travel, mm-hmm. as small as you know five or six, as large as twelve. Uh, and um, we we don't do buses. We don't do big hotels. We connect with the with the local believers, and thirty to forty percent of our trips are connecting with believers that are in the land, supporting organizations. So we do work with um, with Holocaust survivors. We work with an organization called the Aliyah Return Center that helps new Jewish immigrants get settled in the land. We work with an organization called the Beautiful Land Initiative that picks up uh, deals with a lot of the, the the trash and the litter problem around. Uh, Israel's uh, main water source, the mm-hmm. Sea of Galilee. These types of projects, sort of humanitarian aid projects, also with Palestinian Christians. And then there's also uh, adventure day trips and unique biblical sites. So we've we've done everything from snow skiing on Mount Hermon to uh, dune buggies in the desert to snorkeling in the Red Sea wow. to caving and you know anything that you want to do, you can do in Israel on the adventure aspects. And uh, and then as far as the biblical sites, there's there's a whole host of biblical sites that you know uh, that are uh, are so uh, sort of out of the way I suppose that buses can't go to that are that we like to you said something that well. kind of caught my attention uh, you talked about picking up waste and trash and things yeah. and kind of keeping the land clean yes and that uh, raised a little question in my mind about modern Israel mm-hmm. uh, as much as it is God's will that Israel be back in the land it's not perfect over there yet, right? Oh, far from perfect. I mean, if, if you're looking for sin in Israel, it's not hard to find. Um, but regardless of that, uh, God's decision to bring His people back isn't based on their, on their obedience or even on their morality. And uh, the promise, again, going back to Ezekiel 36, God says He'll bring them all back and then he'll sprinkle clean water on them. So the fact that they're, he's that right now Israel is uh, is uh, full of people that are primarily secular, that are doing whatever they want to do, uh, with no thought of God or even their history, uh, is just simply what God said He was going to do. And and I wanted to camp on this point specifically because I I know there are a lot of you out there in our audience. Mm-hmm. Who have said to yourself, well, uh, those people who are back in Israel right now are not really uh, God's chosen people. Mm. They're, they're, they're people. In fact, not even all of them are Jews, and and it's not perfect, and it's certainly not biblical. And you hear a lot of criticism. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah, absolutely. But I think what you said a minute ago, I had a basically uh, enunciates a principle, and that is the principle of God's grace. Not and, perfection, but grace and and faithfulness. I mean, and it's God's bringing His people back to the land the same way that He told them He would bring them into the land the first time. And He says, "Look, when when I'm bringing you in, it's not because you're righteous or you're you know you're you're following the right ways. It's actually you're you're stiff necked and you're hard headed and you know you don't listen half the time." But God makes the promise through Moses from the beginning, "I'm bringing you back because I made a promise," and so it's not based on on their obedience or even that they're even recognizing God is demonstrating his faithfulness to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He said he would bring them all back, 
But it, like Ezekiel 36 says, and other places in the scriptures, there will be a time when they'll look upon the one whom they pierce, mm-hmm. or that they'll sprinkle clean water. And then, and in the passage here, it talks about God saying, "I'm going to remove your stony heart yes. and put in a heart of flesh. I'm going to remove your spirit." and put my spirit within you, which is a, a profound statement in the Old Covenant. God's saying, I'm going to put my spirit within you so you can follow my ways. And so all of these things are not based on Israel's actions, but on God's faithfulness and His kindness. And you mentioned a moment ago about me being a realist. I, I, I am. I, the, the more I'm in Israel, the more I'm, I'm there. I, I read the scriptures very literally and very really because mm-hmm. I, the things that I see in the Bible, I see unfolding in a very tangible and practical way with the people, with the land, with, you know, with the photos in the book, uh, with the history. And uh, it's, it's unfolding just like he said. Again, what an idea. Israel rising at 1948 to 2018. 70 years. And uh, I might have had an idea like this, but I certainly wouldn't have had all the rest that it takes to pull it together. Like, <laughs> and and to, to take 100 pictures from 100 years ago up to maybe 25 years ago and then find the modern counterpart for each picture. Yeah. And so that you can look on the left side and see how things were on the right side, see how things are. And I don't know how to say it, but if you haven't seen the book, you just haven't seen history. Uh, The history, it's right before your very eyes. Yeah, so in the book there's over 100 photo comparisons from over 25 locations throughout the land. And so um, I like to explain it not so much as as a then and now photo book, but uh, there's been lots of photo books that have been done about a lot of different places, but the fact is, is this is the only photo book or the only nation who's had its history foretold 2,600 years ago. And mm-hmm. so, Ezekiel 36, the entire chapter is in the book. We have uh, 2,000 years of eyewitness accounts from Christians, Muslims, and Jews describing what the land looked like up to 1948, and then the dramatic changes that happened after 1948 that completely just fit hand in glove with with what Ezekiel said would happen. And so it's it's not just uh, a, a photo book, but it's it's visual uh, documentation. It's um, it's visual evidence that that the scriptures are are coming to pass right now. So, if you had to tell somebody about Israel, uh, what's the most dramatic thing that, that comes to your mind uh, in, about the miracle of modern Israel? Uh, well, I guess going back to uh, to what we were just talking about is that the the establishment of the state of Israel was not even so much of a of a spiritual renaissance of sorts. It was really intended for you know economic for, you know, purposes for a, a, a place for for Jewish people to to come back to the land and be safe. But regardless of that, regardless that there was really no spiritual connection, we're finding that, like Ezekiel 36, the land is being cultivated and sown, the waste places are being rebuilt, the people are being regathered. They're fulfilling the pages of the Bible, whether they recognize it or not, but it's not based on them. It's based on the fact that God said, I will do it. And anytime God makes a promise, He puts His own character on the line. Is He faithful or is He not? And so to me, there's lots of advancements to talk about. There's incredible water technology, there's uh, the, the biotechnology, tech, uh, anything tech-related coming out of Tel Aviv, the agriculture that's literally making the desert bloom like, like Isaiah talks about. There is all of these advancements that are happening, but what's perhaps more dramatic is that it's happening through people that aren't even really following God so much. Mm-hmm. But yet God is keeping His promises and he'll continue to keep his promise as we just talked about. There will be a sprinkling. There will be a cleansing. It's coming. He said he's going to gather them all back to the land that he promised them. And then he has further plans for them at that point so as well. That's even more of a miracle. Uh, people, that's right. Than, than if they were actually led of the Spirit. And right. That wouldn't be a miracle. That would just be an act of God. Right. But, but to have things happen, one, two, three, four, five, and up to 100, and just all in a row, just like the Bible said. Yeah. It, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and again, I, I keep saying the same thing over and over, I suppose, but it's unfolding exactly as he said. You know, it's, 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 there's no other people group that's been on a piece of land that have been then thrown off for 70 years to return to the same piece of land uh, for a few hundred, and then to be thrown off for several thousand years to come back to the exact same piece of real estate to come back as an identifiable, recognizable people, even speaking the same language. And uh, it just so happens that it's the only people group that the God of 
of the Bible says he's made an everlasting covenant with. So just that in itself is an anomaly in human history. And he's doing it exactly as he said that he would. And, and it's happening in our day. I mean, we're, we're seeing things now that I think that uh, believers even 70, 80 years ago would have never dreamed about. You know, looking at Ezekiel 36 and then Ezekiel 37, the vision of the dry bones, and mm -hmm. I think everybody knows about the, sure. those dry bones that assemble themselves together yes. and they stand up and flesh appears on them. And then the, as you read toward the last of Ezekiel 37, uh, he says, I'll put my spirit in them. And he says, my tabernacle will be with them. So yes. things are happening in sequential order as, as Ezekiel yes. gives them. If, we, if we've seen this much, then we know what's coming. That's right. All through Bible prophecy in the Old Testament, uh, there, and you mentioned rightly, is that Israel is, is the signpost for, for yeah. the earth, is that God says, I'm going to bring them back to the land. He's going to, there's going to be a reestablishment of the nation. The physical land will begin to respond. More people will continue to come. And in the midst of that, any time that God is bringing his people back to the land, there is a, a clear connection of him wanting to meet with the people on the land that he chose. And so if the people are coming back, the nation's been restored, the people continue to come back, the land is physically responding, what do you think the next thing is? You know, what, what do you think is the next on the line? It's, it's, like you said, if it's following this progression, we can expect that this progression will be exactly the same. Very tangible, very practical, and very, uh, you know, very, very visual for sure. Culminating, by the way, in Ezekiel 38, which is a battle, which yeah. is won by the Israeli army. Yeah. Miraculously. Yeah. Uh, which puts the final stamp and seal on, on Israel going into the kingdom. Yes. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you can really, I mean, it's amazing. You read the book and you know what's going to happen, and you can see what's already happened. Yeah. Uh, the book uh, that uh, uh, Doug has put together is called Israel Rising. Uh, it's a, a book of comparisons. Imagine a picture taken 75 years ago, and you find the spot that somebody stood on 75 yeah. years That's ago. Right. That was not easy, right? No, it was. Uh, sometimes it uh, sometimes it worked, and sometimes it you know we really struggled. But it was uh, it was like like I said, it was like a treasure hunt every day. And a hundred comparisons. Yeah. And uh, by the way, the Israel Rising book we're offering to you for a gift of forty dollars, free shipping anywhere in the United States. But as we do uh, here on Prophecy Watchers, uh, we we like to offer packages too, and. And Doug, you have a marvelous uh, biblical calendar. Tell people about the biblical calendar because as you open this calendar you come across some of the same comparison pictures. Yeah, some of the best comparison pictures that are in the book are also in the calendar. But what uh, normally we think of calendars being from January to December. This is one specifically for the 70th anniversary for all year long. And so uh, it begins in April of mm -hmm. 2018 and goes to May 2019 to cover the full year of of, uh, of Israel's 70th anniversary, and I, I think that uh, we'll probably see some really profound and tremendous things in this year. And by the way, I, uh, I'm going to say something now, and and uh, it's the, what I'm about to say is the truth. I've seen a lot of calendars in my day. I don't think I've ever seen as beautiful a calendar as this one. This is just phenomenal. Uh, believe me, you won't throw it away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the pictures are are wonderful. Uh, you have a third item in this Israel Rising package. And uh, this is music uh, from the heart of Israel. It is. And so there's some really, uh, some more, some traditional things that are on there with the, uh, the Shema, also the Aaronic benediction from, uh, from Numbers, uh, number six that's sung in Hebrew. But, uh, but a lot of, uh, a lot of the believers, Israeli believers, or that are sort of the, the remnant that are surviving and growing and thriving in the land, are writing music, and so there's some worship on there that really captures the, the heart of God for the land and for the people. If you want to really experience the spirit of Israel, uh, Doug will take you to that place. Uh, and, and he does so on the basis of, of having traveled. I think probably it's a calling with you. Yeah, uh, for sure. A calling toward the land of Israel. Yeah, indeed. And uh, by the way, the book, calendar, CD, yours for a gift of $70, free shipping anywhere in the United States. And if what I think uh, or imagine will happen actually does happen, you'll look at this book and you'll say, you know, I'd like to give one of these to, to one of my friends or family. 
And for that uh, reason, we, we're also offering a friends and family three pack. Uh, this book, which uh, uh, would be forty dollars, so if we're putting three of them together and offering to the, to offering them to you for a hundred dollars, free shipping anywhere in the United States. It's a great book. Uh, I cannot uh, over uh, speak my uh, absolute. Uh, joy at having opened that first page. Uh, it's just amazing the way you put things together. And uh, my, I guess my first thought was, why didn't I do this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I know I, why I didn't because I don't have the access that you do to the land of Israel and and the energy. I'm sure it took a lot of energy. It was uh, it was five to six weeks of consistent photo shoots and getting you know getting into the right places and finding the right places. But what's exciting to me as well is that not only is the the Christian community behind it in Israel, but uh, but the Jewish communities as well. So I've been doing some. Uh, speaking at synagogues, there's an Orthodox rabbi that wrote the foreword to the book, which I was really honored to have, uh, because they're also recognizing the time and the seasons that are happening in Israel. The Orthodox are beginning to to look at prophecy a, a bit. Yeah, I mean they they recognize that you know after two thousand years that God told them they'd be back in the land and they are, and so they're they recognize that uh, you know they're like like Zechariah talks about the old men are talking about the good times in the streets and the children are playing in the streets and you know it's all unfolding and that's and he he writes a beautiful forward, an Orthodox rabbi from Jerusalem. Well, praise the Lord. Now, again, uh, I want you to mention uh, your touring company. Yes. Uh, and uh, tell us what you're going to be doing in the near future. Uh, what's the calling at, at this point in your life? Well, at Ezra Adventures, we again, we take groups as small as six and as large as 12. And... Um, and we do uh, trips that are specifically based around the people that are going. And so every trip is different. And so if you want to go to a specific uh, area and do a specific thing, whether it be humanitarian or connecting with believers or adventures or you know whatever the case, we, we build it around you. Uh, so we're taking trips all year round. And uh, that's continuing to you know, really be a bridge between Western believers and the fact that Bible prophecy is unfolding and you, you know, meet and have dinner and have Shabbat meals with, uh, with some of the, the, the believers that are making it happen and you're working with them. And you get to breathe Israeli air. I, Israeli air, drinking the water, eating the hummus, it's, you know, what could go wrong? You know, it, it, <laughs> when, when you get off the airplane in Israel, and I've, I've said this, other people I've, I've heard say this, the air even smells different. It's like there's something here that's not anywhere else in the world. It's a special place. Very, very special place. Uh, Doug, we, we really appreciate your work, and uh, come back and see us soon. I would be happy to. His name's Doug Hershey. He's put together Israel Rising, and uh, I want you to look at it. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are. Our second annual Blessed Hope Prophecy Forum is not far away, and here to talk about it, Bob Ulrich. The Prophecy Watchers are coming back to Norman, Oklahoma, October 12th through 14th, 2018. We're going to be back with 30 of the leading names in Bible prophecy. I'm sure you recognize many of the names. Gary Stearman, Tommy Ice, L.A. Marzulli, David Reagan, Jan Markell, Bill Koenig, Don Perkins, Andy Woods, Gary Frazier, Bill Salas. It's a, literally one of the biggest one-of-a-kind prophecy conferences in the world today. It is, Bob. In a year, the year 2018, which just happens to be prophetically important. 30 speakers delivering over 60 messages. You can register for this great event at prophecywatchers.com or you can call our ministry toll-free at 888 722 0008.